So my friend Maria and I are planning a barbecue this weekend. She sent me to the store to get all the groceries. There's not too much on my list. Hot dogs, check. Buns, got it. Oh, wait a minute. There are 10 hot dogs per package and eight buns. Ugh, you mean I have to do math? Looks like we can only make eight hot dogs unless I buy another package of buns. Why couldn't the hot dog people and the bun people just get together and work this out so I only have to buy one of each? All right, enough ranting. The point is, I'm limited by the number of hot dogs I can make by the buns, and I've got too many wieners. So if this were a chemistry problem, the buns would be the limiting reactant. The limiting reactant is the reactant in a chemical reaction that limits the amount of product that can be formed. So a reaction will stop when all of the limiting reactant is consumed. If there's anything left, we say that reactant is in excess. You already know that the coefficients in a chemical equation tell chemists how much starting materials are needed and how many moles of product can be made. In reality, no chemical reaction will use up 100% of your starting materials, nor will any reaction produce as much product as the equation predicts. So sometimes chemists will add a little more reactant than is needed to help drive the reaction forward. Anyway, I got back with all the groceries and Maria got to grilling. Oh, whoops, some of our hot dogs fell into the fire and a few got extra crispy. Next time, I better man the grill. Let's look at a basic combustion reaction to analyze what's happening to our burning dog. Bring on the chemistry. Pretend there are 28 grams of glucose in our hot dog and we've got only 14 grams of oxygen. How much carbon dioxide will be formed from this reaction? Enough to make a significant contribution to global warming? Let's find out. Anytime you're given the masses for both reactants, you know you're dealing with a limiting reactant problem. Let's break this down into smaller pieces. You'll see it's not so bad. Here are three easy steps to complete this type of problem. Let's start with step one. Use stoichiometry and convert each mass of reactant into mass of product. Starting with grams of glucose, convert to moles of glucose using the formula mass. For every one mole of glucose, six moles of carbon dioxide will be made. Multiply by the molar ratio of 6 over 1. This gives us moles of carbon dioxide. Convert that to grams using the formula mass for CO2. Cool. Now do the same calculation using the mass of oxygen given. We're going from grams of reactant to grams of product. Turn grams of oxygen into moles using the formula mass. For each mole of oxygen, one mole of carbon dioxide is made, so the molar ratio is 1 to 1. These sixes cancel. Multiply by the formula mass of carbon dioxide to get grams of CO2. So which one gives you less product? This is your limiting reactant. If all the grams of glucose reacted, you would get 41 grams of carbon dioxide. If all the grams of oxygen reacted, you would have 19 grams of carbon dioxide. Therefore, the amount of oxygen limits how much products you can make. In other words, you will run out of oxygen before you run out of glucose. Hey, good news! Considering the average coal-fired power plant produces 1.2 million tons of carbon dioxide a year, I'd say no major amount of greenhouse gas was produced when our dogs went up in flames. Phew! All right, now that was just a pretend scenario. If you were really cooking outside and you had the grill lid off, you would have an endless supply of oxygen. So unless you put that fire out, the oxygen would continue to fuel the fire and it would keep on burning until there was nothing left of that hot dog. So if your meat catches fire, put a lid on it. If that still doesn't work, it might be time to clean your grill. All right, there you have it. A grill lesson and a chemistry lesson in one. Until next time, this is Lisa D.